much. Um, our speaker has a tough assignment because it's always hardest to address an audience after lunch. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I'm sure you'll, I'm sure you'll all be with him. Speaker of the audience, I didn't get that. <laughs> it's, it's tough for the speaker because after lunch it's hard on the audience after you've had a full lunch to stay awake. But um, as we all know who do public speaking, but I'm sure our next speaker is up to the task and we'll all be fascinated. Uh, to introduce Emmanuel Goldsmith, uh, for me, is a big treat because he currently teaches at the same university where I was an undergraduate and in the same department. But alas and alack, he was just born too late, or I was born too early, for him to have been my teacher, but I wish that he had been. Uh, he's got an illustrious, an illustrious uh, career. He's professor of Yiddish language and literature and Jewish studies at Queens College of the City University of New York. And let me tell you, Queens College is a great institution, and it's also the largest Jewish college in the world, okay? It's got more Jewish students than Hebrew University and even the University of Pennsylvania, I believe. So, so. <laughs> Dr. Goldsmith formally taught um, Hebrew and Judaic studies at the University of Connecticut, and has taught uh, Hebrew and Yiddish literature at Brandeis, Clark University in Massachusetts, and Boston University. He's the author of many texts, including Modern Yiddish Culture, the story of the Yiddish language movement, which has been hailed as, quote, a milestone in Jewish sociolinguistics. You gonna be talking about sociolinguistics today? Absolutely. No? Okay. His other publications include an anthology of Yiddish, Yiddish literature in America, Masters of Lit Yiddish Literature, Modern Trends in Jewish Religion, Dynamic Judaism, Thinkers and Teachers of Modern Judaism, Events and Personalities in Modern Judaism, the American Judaism of Mordecai Kaplan, of which he is the co-editor. He served as an advisor, contributor, and editorial board member of World Scripture, a comprehensive anthology of sacred texts. And uh, Dr. Goldsmith tells me that he's coming out shortly with the first of a two-volume anthology of liter Yiddish literature in America from 1871 to the year 2000. And he's a prophet. The year 2000 isn't even here yet, but his <laughs> anthology is going to cover it. My goodness. He serves on the editorial board of the Jewish Frontier. He's also a member of the exec executive committee of the Congress of Jewish Culture. He has recorded courses on men and ideas of Eastern European Jewry and shapers of modern Jewish thought for the Jewish People's University of the Air of Turo College and a mini course in Yiddish entitled I Love Yiddish for the Education Department of, yes, the Workmen's Circle. He's contributed articles to numerous publications, including Judaism, the Journal of Reform Judaism, Midstream Conservative Judaism, spans all these denominations, Jewish Book Annual, the National Jewish Monthly, the American Journal of Theology and Philosophy, Sukumf, <coughs> Migvan, Studies in Hebrew Literature, Reflections of the Holocaust in Art Literature, Semites and Stereotypes, Aspects of Jewish Humor, New Essays in Religious Naturalism, Studies in Livik, The Religious Experience of Ecological Responsibility, and on and on and on. A real Renaissance man of the Jewish world. He's also a rabbi and has served as rabbi of the congregation Nevak She Derech in Scarsdale, New York. Wow. A wichtige Mensch, a große Mensch. We welcome <laughs> Dr. Emanuel Gold. Lovely. You all know the story of the Magid who traveled from shtetl to shtetl, and wherever he went, before uh, when he began to speak, he said, <laughs> 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 He also remembers of the Knesset stuff like this. They do? <laughs> the Knesset, and that is the situation in which I find myself. Now I know where it I comes I want to thank Rabbi Wine for inviting me. I am thrilled and honored to be here with these distinguished members of the panel and to be in this wonderful institution. I have admired Rabbi Wine from afar for many years. This is from here. I of COVID that sustained that COVID. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
You should do what they did at my bar mitzvah. They gave me a Coca-Cola box to stand on. <laughs> Now, it's not only difficult for the speaker to speak after lunch, it's difficult. called me a grosser mensch. Now <laughs> <laughs> he has a lower one, man. He has a lower one. Oh. <laughs> he likes it. He likes it. Okay, there we go. Try it on. That's for those of you who just ate lunch and are going to fall asleep during the talk. <laughs> Therefore, I want to give you the essence of what I'm about to say. He's competing with And what I want to say is that the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Reconstructionist Judaism, which I have been a loyal and faithful devotee of for 40 years now, the Judaism of Mordecai Kaplan, which is reputed to be philosophical, rationalistic, intellectual, is actually simply a modern presentation of what we used to call in Yiddish Ahavas Yisrael, Ahavat Yisrael, the love of the Jewish people and of everything Jewish. Mordecai Kaplan was a person who was Jewish from the, from his, from the tips of his toes to the hair on his head. And he taught me that to be a Jew, it is not enough to be a good person. And to be a Jew, it is not enough to be an observant person. But the, to be a Jew means to be passionately in love and committed and involved with everything Jewish. Nothing Jewish is alien to me. And that is why I'm going to teach Mr. Jacobs, something about humanistic religion, <laughs> even as I teach Rabbi Friedman Abyssal Mamaloshin. <laughs> That's what the whole thing is. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart, passionately falling in love with everything Jewish. Some of, them, some of us are blessed. We got that love with our mother's milk. <clears throat> you know, love can only be caught. It cannot be taught. I cannot intellectually tell anybody why to be Jewish, why to struggle for the survival of the Jewish people. I'm in love with everything Jewish. And to me, when I am, I am a true follower and devotee of my beloved teacher, rabbi and friend, Mordechai Menachem Kaplan, who was born in 1881 and died in 1983. 1881 to 1983. His is the most seminal voice in the evolution of American Judaism in the 20th century. His influence is felt in every aspect of Jewish life, communal, cultural, educational, and religious. His thought has affected the institutional and ideological configurations of all groups within American Jewry, Reform, Orthodox, Conservative, Zionist, and Secularist. While the Orthodox shun his writings like the plague, and the Conservatives remain overtly hostile 
to his radical theology. Much of what they do and say is in response to challenges posed in his essays and addresses. The reform movement, while refusing to commit itself to religious naturalism and religious humanism, has been much more open to Kaplan's influence in the past than have the other groupings. The repudiation of reform's predominantly theological Pittsburgh platform of 1885, which we heard about so eloquently from Rabbi Friedman, and its replacement by the guiding principles of Columbus, Ohio, in 1937, which included sociological and cultural perspectives, may be traced directly to the impact of articles which Kaplan published in the Menorah Journal in the 1920s and 1930s, as well as to his magnum opus of 1934, Judaism as a Civilization. Kaplan's influence on the rabbis and educators of the conservative movement is the result of more than a half century in which he served as a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary. The ambivalent attitude of the institution to Kaplan was more than compensated for by the loyalty and adulation of generations of students. Recent liberal developments within conservative Judaism, such as the ordination of women as rabbis, cannot be explained without reference to Kaplan's work. Kaplan's most important institutional and organizational achievements, however, must be, th be sought within his own reconstructionist movement. With the founding of the Society for the Advancement of Judaism in 1922 and the Reconstructionist magazine in 1935, Kaplan's ideology began to provide the basis for a fourth Jewish religious denomination. Kaplan's fears of further fragmenting American Jewry actually hampered the growth of Reconstructionist Judaism until the 1960s, when Kaplan finally realized that his hopes of eventually dominating the conservative movement were illusory. The establishment of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in Philadelphia in 1968 sought to provide Reconstructionism with a new leadership that might gradually revitalize Kaplan's concepts of transnatural and religio-cultural Judaism. That is what Kaplan first called his thinking, religio-cultural Judaism. Then he called it Zionist Judaism. Not Zionism, the political movement, but Zionist movement. Unfortunately, it eventually came to be called Reconstructionist Judaism. Reconstructionism, a word was is mehr umgelumpert wie secular humanistic Judaism. <laughs> While expressly formulated with the American environment in mind, Kaplan's ideology has enormous implications for Judaism throughout the world, and its influence is slowly penetrating other parts of the Jewish diaspora as well as Israel. For half a century, beginning in the 1920s, Kaplan succeeded in disseminating his ideas as an ideology without much of an organization, a school of thought, as he called it. Its influence on conservative and reform Judaism, and even on modern orthodoxy, was significant. Nevertheless, the two so-called liberal movements absorbed the trappings of Reconstructionism without buying into its basic principles. That Judaism is not just a religion, but a culture and a civilization that supernaturalism is a threat to the future of both the Jewish people and the Jewish religion, and that the ultimate goal of Judaism is the preservation of the Jews as an ethical nation. The creation of an internationally recognized Congress or parliament representing world Jewry with representation at the United Nations, and the dissemination of the concept of ethical nationhood to other peoples and religions. As Kaplan saw it, reform and conservative Judaism 
were unable to function except as a kind of Christless Protestantism, in the case of Reform, and as a truncated Halachism, in the case of Conservatism. The failure of nerve among religious intellectuals following the Holocaust, which included the rise of neo-Hasidism among Jews, made the vigorous espousal of anti-supernaturalism impossible for them. The resistance of the conservative movement to the suggestion by Kaplan that it joined the World Zionist Organization as an organized body in the 1950s spelled frustration for Kaplan's desire to transform the religious denominations into an ethical nation with structural, not merely emotional ties to the international Zionist movement. By the late 1960s, Kaplan was therefore ready to accept the advice of some of his colleagues that the only future for his ideology lay in its transformation into a full-fledged religious denomination with a rabbinical seminary of its own that would serve as a rallying symbol for the faithful and also expedite the raising of sorely needed funding. Thus, the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College came into being in 1968 in order to provide concreteness and visibility to Kaplan's ideas. Kaplan gave the college his blessing, but was already too along in years to steer its course. His death in 1983 marked the end of Kaplanian Reconstructionism as a movement and the birth of post-Kaplanian Reconstructionism or the attempt to transform Kaplan's movement into just another religious denomination. In effect, Reconstructionist Judaism has been transformed from a movement seeking to implement and build upon Kaplan's principles into a movement of support for the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. The movement has duplicated the failure of the reform and conservative movements to create laities with understanding and commitment to what their respective movements stand for. In order to be all things to all people, Reconstructionism has gone with the wind of fashion to the point where its Kaplanianism is hardly visible. Probably its worst offense has been the surrender to so-called spirituality, neo-mysticism, and irrationalism. Nothing testifies more clearly to the decline of the Kaplanian way than graduates of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College who haven't the foggiest notion of what Kaplan was all about, but who nevertheless style themselves true Reconstructionists. <coughs> that the Reconstructionists have more than acquiesced to the religion without civilizationism of the other movements is manifest in the complete identification of the movement with the synagogue and ritualism. Instead of the creation of new and the support of existent non-synagogal manifestations of Jewish life. The new Reconstructionist prayer books, for, to take one example, have re-legitimized Jewish chosenness. Reconstructionism has become almost entirely identified with the current trends in Reform Judaism, which endorse the surrender to ritualism and pseudo-spirituality as long as they are in tune with the fads of the day. Kaplan's commitment to intellectualism and rationalism has been forgotten. Blind acceptance of religious dogmas and habit-propelled rituals are unethical, said Mordecai Kaplan. 
anti-intellectualism or irrationalism, no matter how euphemistically disguised as intuitionism, romanticism, or mysticism, distorts the truth and corrupts the sense of reality. Any conception of divinity based upon delusion partakes of idolatry in religion as in other aspects of human life faith in tradition and blind obedience to authority should give way to reasoned experience and confidence in humanity's moral responsibility now what the reconstructionist movement still has going for it is the heritage of Mordecai Kaplan. Whether it has the courage and the ability to develop, to wholeheartedly embrace and develop that priceless legacy still remains to be seen. There's that water. You, you, I'm not a dry speaker, but I need a little vase. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Mordecai Kaplan, his middle name was Menachem, by the way. Mordecai Menachem Kaplan was the most consistent practitioner of religious modernism among Jews in the 20th century. Religious modernism may be distinguished from traditionalism in that its point of departure in religious life is the contemporary scene and present day religious experience rather than the dictates of authority and the experience of past generations. The religious modernist is an eclectic, selecting out of the treasures of his forebears only those which he sees as relevant and significant for his community's life today. And Rabbi Kaplan always taught, we must shun nostalgia like a swamp. Only those aspects of tradition which can be reconciled with what we regard as true and valid in our general worldview and approach to life may be incorporated into our religious conceptions. For Mordecai Kaplan, it is, I say is, not was. For Mordecai Kaplan, it is modernity, despite all of its flaws and failings, that must be the judge and test of tradition rather than the reverse. Religious modernists wholeheartedly embrace such modern concepts as democracy. I say this to my ultra-Orthodox mishpach in Israel, and they say to me, Wo steht democracy geschritten in der Teure? He said democracy. And the answer is, Sie steht nicht geschrieben, nur man darf es reinstellen. It's not written, you have to put it in. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I understand. He has to put it down. No, no. I, I know you have You want me to I translate it, not as Kenish Ken Ladino. is how you read it. It's very nice. <laughs> not important. Let's go on. <laughs> Democracy, evolution, evolution. Divine immanence, the idea that God must be found in the world, in human life, not beyond it. All of these concepts which are crucial in 20th century thought are wholeheartedly <laughs> embraced by religious modernists. Mordecai Kaplan's definition of Judaism as an evolving religious civilization was essentially a call 
for openness in Judaism. Abandonment of traditional Judaism was for him essentially a voluntary severance from whatever comforts and benefits Jews derived in the past from their former self-segregation and isolation from general society. The modern world, as Kaplan understands it, demands free intercourse and exchange of ideas and experiences as indispensable to intellectual and moral growth as well as to the general peace and renders isolationism and self-segregation absolutely untenable. Jews now need to appropriate and integrate into Jewish culture values found in other cultures that are compatible with Judaism. Moreover, they need to contribute to other cultures by translating and interpreting their Jewish cultural creations for non-Jews. The separatism of the past must make way for the principle of otherness. Separatism is the antithesis of cooperation and results in an ingrown and clannish remoteness which leads to cultural stagnation. Otherness thrives best when accompanied by active cooperation and interaction with neighboring cultures and civilizations and achieves an individuality which is of universal significance. Kaplan placed what he regarded to be the major problems of the Jewish people in the modern era under the categories of nationalism and naturalism. The solution of the problems in each of these categories would require openness to new developments in both Jewish and general life and thought. The problems of nationalism could be met head on by a renewed dedication to Zionism, seen as a salvational ideology and not merely as a political movement. That is, the purpose of Zionism was for Kaplan not simply to erect a state in the Middle East, but to save the Jewish people from disappearing from the face of the earth. The challenge of naturalism or the scientific worldview could likewise be met by the formulation and unabashed endorsement of naturalism, and it's this worldly interpretation of salvation as providing new approaches to religious experience and religious truth. And since a few of us have not been to college in a few years, naturalism simply means that all we can ever know about is the universe that we know about, the world, not something that is beyond space and time. For Kaplan, Modern Zionism, both as an ideology and as a, as a movement, represents the quintessential expression of Judaism in modern times. Zionism equals Judaism. Judaism equals Zionism. But not Zionism viewed narrowly, and not Judaism viewed dogmatically. He views Zionism as the only movement capable of salvaging the collective identity of the Jewish people from the melting pot of modern nationalism. Zionism has been vindicated principally because the Jewish people has been given a new lease on life with the establishment of the State of Israel. It has moreover taught Jews to treat Judaism as an all-embracing civilization which can elicit from them a sense of spiritual rootedness in Eretz Yisrael, a feeling of oneness with the 40 century old people of Israel, a desire to understand its languages and literature, a yearning to cherish its aspirations, and an eagerness to live its way of life with its mores, laws, and arts. Zionism is contemporary Judaism in action signifying above all 
that the Jewish people is actively engaged in adjusting itself to the modern world. It is Jewry's effort to burst its cerements, step out of its mummified condition, and rise out of the valley of dead bones. It is Judaism in modern dress, the Messiah commuting on a jet plane instead of riding on a donkey. You can applaud, it's all right. <laughs> now, the primary function of Zionism today, and what I mean by that is Zionism has succeeded, but it's not over yet. Zionism's function today is to stimulate Jews in the diaspora who possess a sense of adventure and are proficient in one or another field of endeavor to go to Israel and contribute to its upbuilding. But it must also motivate those who remain in the diaspora to perpetuate their Jewish heritage and foster their Jewish group individuality. That Zionism has thus far miserably failed to do. Jews of the diaspora should be encouraged to resist the forces which tend to break up minority groups. In order to accomplish these objectives, contemporary Zionism must repudiate its traditional shlilat hagalut, negation of the diaspora, and encourage Jewish survival and spiritual and cultural creativity wherever Jews live. Herzl was right. We are a people, he said at the first Zionist Congress. We are one people. Zionism must cease viewing the Jews exclusively as a land-bound people. It should also forestall the danger of divorcing the future of the Jewish people from the future of the Jewish religion and strive to have every Jew realize that Judaism seeks both to provide its adherents with a sense of corporate unity and to help them achieve their destiny as human beings. And that's all we mean by religion. The organized attempt to help people, you and I, achieve our destiny as human beings, to be all that we can and should be. By changing the priorities of classical Zionism, this new Zionism, as Kaplan called it, makes the reconstitution and reorganization of world Jewry its primary goal, and the security and development of the state of Israel the major means to that end. Until now, the goal of world Jewry has been to establish and make Israel secure. Now the goal of Israel must be to establish and help make the Jewish people of the world strong and secure. Zionism constituted Jewish democracy. That's what's modern about it. Democracy in action, insofar as it embraced the following principles. One, the reinterpretation of the messianic ideal from that of passive waiting for a supernatural miracle to the exertion of initiative to throw off the yoke of oppression. Two, the refusal to regard the dispersion of the Jews as a divinely decreed expiation or a form of divine discipline. And three, the decision to reinstate Jewish nationhood where it might function as a means of securing the maximum welfare and collaboration of all who came within its purview in keeping with the highest ideals of democracy. And that is the only reason that we have a right to fight ultra-orthodoxy. We don't fight their right to live as they wish. But we fight their desire to destroy the democracy which alone can save 
the Jewish people from extinction. Zionism must therefore be viewed as both a liberation movement and as a salvational ideology, provided that salvation be interpreted in a this-worldly, because that's the only world we know about, humanistic manner. Kaplan called himself a religious humanist. Kaplan insisted that, in essence, democracy is a quality of nationhood. You can't have democracy unless you have a nation first. Under its influence, that is the influence of democracy, national solidarity functions as a means of fostering the maximum welfare and collaboration of all who compose the nation, regardless of race, color, or creed. Such welfare and collaboration presupposes unity in diversity and freedom from oppression and exploitation. Democracy's purpose is to have justice and kindness instead of tyranny and cruelty prevail in all human relationships, to bring under control the inherent tendency of human beings to seek power and to exercise it for its own sake regardless of the harm it does. Democracy seeks to salvage the freedom of the mind to recover the right of every human being to exercise the most divine power which he or she possesses, the power of reason. That is the kind of democracy in action that Zionism at its best has brought and must continue to bring to the Jewish people. Kaplan wrote that at the heart of modern nationalism are the revolt against the pessimism of traditional religion and the faith in humanity's will and capacity to transcend its subhuman tendencies. For him, naturalism has replaced supernaturalism and science has replaced theology in the modern world as a result of the growing confidence of people in their own abilities which developed together with the rise of national cultures. As it was necessary in ancient times, and I quote, to break the bonds of religion with belief in God as miracle worker who at will suspends the laws of nature. By the same token, the assumption that this miracle working God at some point in the past revealed himself to humanity and made known to it for all time the way of salvation should no longer be allowed to serve as an infallible description of genuine religion. Kaplan rejects the supernaturalist notion that God's power manifests itself primarily in the abrogation of natural law. He urges that this pre-modern conception be modified in the light of empirical human experience. This results in the idea of humanity as an integral part of cosmic nature. Therefore, humanity's potentialities, which when realized enable us to make the most of life, are to be viewed as the extension of tendencies or laws in the cosmos. As such, they represent the moral law of our being and at the same time reveal the godhood or divinity of the cosmos. Godhood, God, divinity, all related terms refer simply to the goodness that is in us and the world. Kaplan used the word God and the good or goodness as synonyms. Supernaturalism is also objectionable because it is at variance with modern religion's emphasis on ethics and responsibility, not obedience. Kaplan urged that traditional religious beliefs and practices be interpreted naturalistically or in the light of understandable and communicable experience 
which does not hide behind clouds of mystifying practices, or what today is called, as we heard, spirituality. Finally, supernaturalism's assumption that God is a person, being, or fact is based on the view of the word God as a noun or substantive term. If, however, the word is viewed as a functional noun or as a verb, it may denote something exceptional or unusual, but not necessarily supernatural. That is, God is a value, the value of goodness. God is simply a process or factor in nature. For Kaplan, the word God must always be related in the human sphere to conscience or holiness. But our sense of holiness and our conscience is part of nature. It is part of the universe. The goodness is in us and around us. It is related cosmically to organicity, the idea that the totality is greater than the sum of its parts. Whatever is in us is also outside of us and beyond us. The idea of God needs to be derived from those laws and tendencies in nature which can assist humanity in improving itself and the world. The term God is meaningless, said Kaplan, unless a causal connection can be clearly established between the term God and being a moral, sensitive, and responsible person. In most of religion today, including Jewish religion, the term God has very little to do with that. And that is why I understand Rabbi Wine's attitude to the term. Kaplan had another approach. He said that the term also always contained in it, I shouldn't say always, often contained within it in the past the meaning of goodness. In the Bible, God often means goodness. Not always, but sometimes God means goodness. And in order to maintain continuity with the past, we ought to retain the term. It's a good issue for debate. <coughs> and I hope that Rabbi Wein and I will be here to debate it. Bis <laughs> 120 <laughs> Naturalism's <laughs> advantage <coughs> over supernaturalism, I have a wonderful wife, she's sitting in the back and she's looking at her watch already. <laughs> when she looks at her watch, <laughs> <laughs> so just bear with me a little bit more. <laughs> Taurus, right, yeah. <laughs> Let me say this. Kaplan's approach to religion has to do with salvation. That was his favorite word. Many students at the seminary in my day used to say, it's a goyish word, salvation. It's used only in Christianity. And Kaplan would respond, do you say Havdalah every week? When we raise the Havdalah cup and we light the Havdalah candle, we say, Hine el Yeshuati, God is my help, my salvation. It is repeated there over and over and over. Actually, in the Tanakh, in our Jewish Bible, God is referred to as the God of salvation, Yeshua, 273 times. Kaplan counted them and I checked. <laughs> 273 <laughs> times. <laughs> Whatever helps us to be what we can be, what we should be, what we know <coughs> at our best we ought to be, is God. I didn't expect to have that nice.
round it. Much applause here. Kaplan characterized the human being as a salvation seeking animal. Salvation means maximum life. Human beings are people who care not only about life, but about living life to the maximum. That's why I took my 15 pills this morning. <laughs> I want to live to the maximum. With the pills? <laughs> According to Kaplan, <laughs> According to Kaplan, <laughs> being important to someone, being needed by someone, that is salvation. That is living life to the maximum. The person who is not needed and who doesn't need others is not alive even if you see him walk the streets. <laughs> salvation means to a person or a people being rescued from drowning in a sea of futility and meaninglessness. Salvation is tantamount to continuous growth and progressive approximation to the ideal of perfection. Salvation is durable happiness. And God is the power or process that makes for such salvation. Kaplan's innovative definition of Judaism, I hope you'll remember that, as an evolving religious civilization, underscores his understanding of the centrality of peoplehood <coughs> in the Jewish religion, as well as his naturalistic interpretation of the origin and hmm. nature of Judaism. That Judaism is a religious civilization implies that the survival of the Jewish people, in the diaspora at least, depends on its making religion a matter of vital interest. And I would like to say I think it's true of Israel also. Because unless there is a dynamic, new, modern, this-worldly approach to religion in Israel, the ultra-Orthodox will have the day. And that will, chas v'shalom, be the end of Israel as a de democratic state. <laughs> the Jewish religion has to provide a world outlook and conception of God that it can, can encourage living in a spirit of moral responsibility, honesty, loyalty or love, and creativity. You see, those things, moral responsibility, honesty, Loyalty, love, and creativity pervade the universe. They pervade the universe. They are found in the tiniest atom and in the largest planet. Moreover, the civilizational approach to religion enables the adherent to be loyal to his faith without pretensions to superiority and affords a sound basis for interfaith goodwill. It is not revelation. It is not the divine teachings that God has given to us through Moses, but the Torah and Jewish tradition and Jewish customs and everything Jewish is more than that. It is the expression of the spirit and the soul of the Jewish people. If we want to see the Jewish people live, then we will not behave cavalierly when it comes to any of these things. No Jew can do everything or should do everything. But if you do nothing, you're not a Jew. Because being a Jew is doing. 
Kaplan believes that different religions result from the fact that each civilization sees in the important elements of its life media through which its people may achieve self-fulfillment or salvation. These sancta, as he called them, include historic <laughs> events, heroes, institutions, places, and objects to which sanctity is ascribed. In effect, such sancta, the attitude toward life that they imply, and the conduct they inspire constitute the religion of each people and civilization. Describing Judaism as a religious civilization signifies the fact that the Jewish people has consciously sought throughout its history to make its collective experience yield meaning for the enrichment of the life of the individual Jew and for the spiritual greatness of the Jewish people. I don't know why, so don't ask me, but I love the Jewish people. And because I love the Jewish people, I give everything Jewish a break. I don't accept everything. I don't buy everything. I don't do everything. But I give the Jewish people the benefit of the doubt. I give Judaism a break. The civilizational definition also makes possible the acceptance by Judaism of the principles already mentioned of uni unity in diversity and continuity in change. It is moreover a reminder of the fact that Judaism consists of much that cannot be pigeonholed into the category of religion, and that in modern times, quote, paradoxical as it may sound, the spiritual regeneration of the Jewish people demands that religion cease to be its sole preoccupation. In the sense, everybody sleeping now, wake up. <laughs> in the sense, that existence precedes essence. You study existentialism? Existence precedes essence. And life takes precedence over thought. Judaism exists for the sake of the Jewish people rather than the Jewish people existing for the sake of Judaism. In order for Judaism to survive and grow in a world of ever accelerating change, it must be responsive to the external physical needs, but also and perhaps primarily to the internal spiritual needs of its constituency. Thus, Mordecai Kaplan's passion for openness and that's a modern idea that we should be responsive not only to our tribe and our clan, but to other tribes, other clans, to the world, to the universe, to the cosmos. His passion for openness prodded him to heed not only the voice of nature and what he called nature's God, the goodness in the universe, but also a voice that we must always listen to, the voice of the living Jewish people. Thank you.